Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. At question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. So apparently, the First Minister couldn't bear to watch the SNP leaders debate this week. <laughs> but, but her ears must have been burning as the candidates torched her record in government. Now, I like to be helpful to the First Minister, so let me recap some of the things that were said. I'm quite happy to continue if you are presiding officer. If you're content to I'm continue, I'm very happy Mr. to continue. Ross, they can ignore to. them while I direct my comments to the First Minister. So let's be absolutely clear. I can be helpful to the First Minister if people can hear, but maybe we can't, presiding officer. So we've tried. We've tried. We have tried, Mr. Ross. We will suspend briefly. Thank you. Um, we will resume. Please, please begin at the beginning, Mr. Uh, thank Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, John Swinney and Nicola Sturgeon seem to be enjoying the start of my question, so I think I'll repeat it. Because I was just saying, apparently, the First Minister couldn't bear to watch this week's SNP leaders' debate, uh, but her ears must have been burning as the candidates torched the SNP's record uh, in government. So let me be helpful to Nicola Sturgeon as I try to do an update her on what was said. Her finance secretary, Kate Forbes, said this about Scotland. The trains never run on time. The police service is stretched to breaking point. There's record high waiting times in the NHS. Does the First Minister applaud, as we do on this side of the chamber, her finance secretary's honest assessment of this SNP's record in government? First Minister. Well, well. Of course, I, I didn't unfortunately catch the uh, leaders' debate the other night um, because I was, I was on my way back from a wonderful visit to the inspirational Glasgow Women's Library, um, a, a fabulous place that I would recommend to anybody across the chamber. Um, and, presiding officer, uh, for my part, uh, of course, the only verdict on my government that really matters is the verdict from the people we serve, the people of Scotland. And that verdict has been pretty clear uh, over the eight years of my leadership, uh, winning no fewer than eight elections. Uh, and let me perhaps remind Douglas Ross, trying as I always do to be helpful to him, uh, why that might be the case. Uh, because under this government, we've seen a 20% increase in NHS staff, the highest number of doctors and nurses proportionately anywhere in the UK. We've seen a doubling of the NHS budget. Uh, we've seen uh, the best performing A&Es uh, anywhere in the UK for the last seven years. The only part of the UK with no NHS strikes and the highest paid workforce anywhere on these islands. A significant reduction in hospital 
infections. £10,000 nurse bursaries at a time when the Tories in England scrapped yeah. nurse bursaries. Yeah. Scrap prescription charges, take away parking charges at NHS hospitals, yeah. leading the way on public health measures. Presenting officer, I can see you're looking at me askance. That's just the NHS. I look forward to getting on to other topics later <laughs> in this session. Douglas Ross. Well, if the First Minister really did miss the first TV debate, there's another one tonight. I'm just really worried that 30 minutes isn't going to be long enough for the candidates to trash her record uh, in government. Now, last week, last week I said there seems to be two Kate Forbes, one with a terrible record in government and one who says this government has a terrible record. But now the Finance Secretary is in an even bigger guddle. She can't decide if she's in government or she's in opposition. Just listen to that statement from Kate Forbes again. The current finance secretary said that the current SNP government leaves trains that never run on time, the police service stretched to breaking point and record high waiting times in our NHS. That's a quote sorted for every Scottish Conservative leaflet going forward. And there's even more material that we can use. Kate Forbes said, more of the same is not a manifesto, it's an acceptance of mediocrity. The First Minister might expect to hear that from me, but did she really expect to hear that from her own Finance Secretary? First Minister. Well, you see, Presiding Officer, I am very, very aware that for Douglas Ross, uh, mediocrity, of course, is a dizzy height that he's never come close <laughs> to achieving. There's also... Lovely. Lovely. Thank you. Lovely. There's also... There's no confusion whatsoever about where Douglas Ross is in terms of government or opposition. He's in opposition yeah. now, and he's going to remain yeah. in opposition for a long, long time to come. But helpfully, and he has been very helpful today, I'm, I'm most appreciative, he's taken me into other subject matters. So briefly, presiding officer, uh, he talked about crime. So let's talk about the record of my government endorsed eight times in eight years under my leadership by the Scottish people. Uh, crime down by more than 48%. Yep. Violent crime alone down by 48%. Automatic early Excuse me, ended. First Minister. Let's have one speaker at a time, please. First Minister. Automatic early release ended, of course, opposed by the yeah. Scottish yeah. Conservatives. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we see re-offending rates amongst the lowest ever, the higher, highest number of police officers than at any time during previous Scottish administrations, higher proportionately than any other part of the UK. It strengthened the law on domestic abuse. Uh, and then there's transport, ScotRail in public ownership. Yeah. Yeah. Lower fares on average than where the Tories are in power. £11 billion of investment in rail like infrastructure. The M74 completed the Aberdeen bypass built, the Queensferry crossing built, the highest investment in active travel of any UK nation. I could go on, presiding officer, and I'm happy to do so later on. Douglas Ross. Well, if, if the First Minister did continue that record in government on transport, it would be the A9 delayed, the A96 delayed, ferries that are rusting in the docks, not serving the island communities that they're there for. But the First Minister seems to think if she doesn't mention Kate Forbes, if she pretends she didn't watch it, these comments didn't occur. This was a Scottish Government Minister, someone currently serving under Nicola Sturgeon, tearing apart this record in government. And if Nicola Sturgeon won't focus on Kate Forbes, we know that one of our closest allies will. Shona Robeson, a current Cabinet colleague of Kate Forbes, said that Kate Forbes is trashing the record of the SNP government. But, but Kate Forbes has voted for every single SNP policy. She's backed every single SNP referendum demand and every one of the SNP budgets. She's the Finance Secretary. She writes the budgets. Uh, and Kate Forbes was Nicola Sturgeon's right-hand woman, handpicked by the First Minister to rise rapidly up through the ranks. When promoting Kate Forbes in February 2020, 
The First Minister said this in the chamber. Kate Forbes has a forensic grasp of detail. <laughs> on this government's record, she's got the detail bang on the money, hasn't she? First Minister. Well, of course, all three of uh, those colleagues of mine uh, vying to be my successor, vying to have the joy of First Minister's questions every Thursday at 12 o'clock, all of them uh, either are or have been members of my government. So, of course, they all share in the success uh, of the government that I am proud uh, to lead. Now, I am, of course, uh, by my own choice, now an outgoing leader. But I want to be, be serious for a minute here. Uh, nobody needs a running commentary from me. Certainly nobody needs a running commentary from Douglas Ross on anything. <laughs> but that is a, another matter. Nobody needs a running commentary from me. But if I was to offer advice, uh, firstly to uh, those uh, vying to succeed me, it would be this. Uh, of course, uh, the internal process is really important. Uh, but while it might not feel it right now, it is actually the relatively easy part. Being First Minister is hard, it's tough, it is a massive responsibility. And whoever emerges in the position of First Minister and is standing here three weeks today has one overriding task, presiding officer. It is to govern and it is to serve in a way that inspires the people of Scotland to keep placing trust in us just as they have done consistently since 2007 and just as they have done eight times over the eight years of my leadership. That's what matters uh, because without that trust, nothing else is possible. And finally, to my opponents, perhaps a word to the wise uh, as well. Um, I can't grudge you uh, watching the first SNP leadership election in 20 years because we've had lots of Tory and Labour leaderships <laughs> to enjoy over these years. Uh, but here's that word to the wise. For as long as you are using virtually all of your airtime in talking about the SNP, because you have nothing positive to offer, then fundamentally the problem is not ours, presiding officer. The problem is yours, because you're destined to stay exactly where you are right now in opposition. Dr. Shaw. If, if only the SNP candidates had something positive to offer rather than fighting with each other. Uh, but Kate Forbes has been so honest about the SNP's record in government that just this morning, Mary Black, the SNP's Deputy Westminster Leader, said the SNP could split over this contest. Nicola Sturgeon has divided Scotland and now her departure is dividing the SNP. Yet while the SNP go through this civil war, the real priorities of Scotland are being ignored. This divided and distracted party is failing to give Scots the health service they deserve. Well, the current health secretary is mumbling while I'm speaking about his portfolio area. So let's go through what has been said this week. BMA Scotland told us that nearly half of junior doctors are thinking of quitting. On Monday, an investigation reported one in five people in Scotland have been forced to go private for health treatment. There are 773,000 Scots on an NHS waiting list just now. And 10 patients a month are travelling to Lithuania for treatment. Travelling from Scotland to Lithuania for treatment. So, First Minister, when you said people should focus on governing and serving, shouldn't the SNP leadership candidates focus on the crisis in our NHS, not the crisis in their party? First Minister. Let me go on to the NHS in a second. But, you know, every single one of the SNP politicians that has been mentioned by Douglas Ross today um, has more popular uh, and public approval than he does. Douglas Ross, I think is the uh, least popular elected leader in Scotland today. So my advice to him was intended to be helpful. Perhaps if he spent a bit more time looking Thank in the you. mirror and reflecting really on the like reasons it. for his party's and his personal unpopularity yeah. and a bit less time thinking about the SNP, he might not be in the dire straits he's in right now.
And in terms of the NHS, uh, of course our NHS faces significant uh, challenges, but of course the numbers uh, self-funding private care in Scotland are lower, significantly lower, than they are in Tory-run England uh, or indeed uh, Labour-run Wales. We are now seeing uh, reductions, considerable reductions, whether it's in outpatients or inpatients, in the longest waits, uh, because we are focusing on NHS recovery. And it's because we're focusing on NHS recovery uh, that no NHS workers have been forced onto strike action in Scotland and in our fact in terms of agenda for change the highest paid workers anywhere in the UK. That's the focus on the NHS we have and will continue to have for as long as we're in government. Question number two, Anna Sawa. Presenting officer, week after week I have asked the First Minister about the NHS and week after week she has defended the indefensible and asked patients to accept the unacceptable. Now, members of our own government accept that the NHS is in crisis. Kate Forbes has said that more of the same won't cut it, and she's called out Hamza Youssef for delivering record waiting times. After nearly 16 years in government, the performance of our NHS is the worst it's ever been. It needs a serious plan to fix it. So does the First Minister agree that continuity, mediocrity and incompetence won't cut it? First Minister. Uh, continued focus uh, on the part of whoever is First Minister on delivering for the people of Scotland uh, and retaining the trust of the people of Scotland, as I said earlier on, uh, is the priority and should be the priority uh, of whoever is standing here in just three weeks' time. Uh, let me talk specifically about the NHS, though, because the NHS in Scotland, in England, in Wales, in Northern Ireland, across much of the world, is facing challenges uh, largely because of the pandemic that has afflicted all of us over these past three years. Uh, because of the recovery plan, uh, because of the record investment that we are putting into the NHS, the record number of staff, uh, we are now seeing progress in that recovery. So take uh, waits for outpatients. The numbers uh, experiencing waits of over a year, down almost 9% in the last quarter. Numbers uh, waiting over two years, down 50% in the last quarter, down 60% since the, the peak. Uh, we are seeing similar reductions in inpatients uh, and reductions in those waiting for diagnostic uh, tests as well. We're seeing the numbers being seen in our NHS going up. Uh, is that tough? Yes. Uh, toughest of all for those working in our NHS, but it is our focus on the NHS that is seeing those improvements and will continue to do so. Anna Sarwar. Incompetence has serious consequences. Dr Chris Adams, one of Scotland's leading paediatric surgeons, says his patients are suffering because of a lack of staff and he's had enough. Crucially, he says it's not due to COVID. And one of Dr Adams' patients is Harvey Martin. Harvey is nine years old. He suffers from neurofibromatosis, which is a genetic condition that causes tumours to grow on the nervous system. In August last year, he was told he needed urgent surgery within four weeks to correct a curve in his spine. Seven months on, he is still waiting. The curve is now harming his internal organs and he is left in excruciating pain. A nine-year-old in excruciating pain for seven months. This is a serious consequences of incompetence. His mum, Natalie, told me yesterday that she can't watch her child in pain any longer. She's looking at private options and will fundraise for Harvey's treatment. First Minister, why are children having to wait so long for urgent treatment, and why are families having to contemplate paying to relieve their child's pain? First Minister. Well, no parent should contemplate that. Um, obviously, uh, other than uh, the details Anna Sarwar has shared with me uh, just now, I don't know the details of Harvey's case, but I, I will look into that uh, and respond more fully. Uh, I have heard uh, concerns that have been expressed uh, by Dr Chris Adams, and all these concerns uh, have been uh, investigated by NHS Lothian, and these are, are general notes, uh, as I understand it, in relation to Harvey's case in particular. They have been invested by, uh, investigated by NHS Lothian, uh, but I have uh, this morning, in fact, uh, asked officials uh, to ensure that we have more external assurance uh, to satisfy ourselves that there is no substance to those concerns. Uh, the NHS, as all of us know, uh, is facing significant challenges. 
Um, it is largely down to COVID. Yes, there were pressures uh, that predated COVID, but in most countries, uh, the pressures on health services are down to COVID. Uh, that is why we are focusing on the investment, the recruitment, the reform uh, to help tackle those challenges. Uh, Anna Sarwar uh, cited Dr Adams' uh, comments in relation to staff. We have record numbers of staff in our NHS uh, today. Uh, staffing is up uh, since this government took office by uh, 22%. We have higher staffing per head than NHS England. Uh, we have uh, higher numbers of nurses and midwives and doctors uh, than in the health services in other parts of the UK. Uh, so we will continue to focus, focus hard each and every day on supporting our NHS so that it is delivering for all patients every day, including uh, children like Harvey. But as I say, uh, I will look further into uh, the specifics of Harvey's case and respond either to Anna Sarwar or directly to Harvey's family in due course. Anna Sarwar. Prime Officer, I think it's important to repeat two things. One, Dr Adams says this is not due to COVID. So the First Minister needs to stop hiding behind COVID. And secondly, incompetence has serious consequences. Incompetence might be funny, in an SNP leadership debate, but incompetence in government means people losing their lives right now across Scotland. Because across Scotland, thousands of people are opting to pay for treatment because they can't wait for the NHS. And research by the BBC shows that one in five people say they or a family member have paid for medical treatment. One in five. And NHS staff like Dr Adams are speaking out about waiting times because of the risk to their patients' lives. And shamefully, other clinicians were gagged by Lothian and Greater Glasgow and Clyde health boards yep. from speaking out publicly because they know that there is a crisis. Thousands of operations cancelled, the worst any waiting times on record, over 5,500 nursing and midwifery vacancies, 770,000 patients on an NHS waiting list, record breaking levels of delayed discharge. This is a crisis 16 years in the making because of SNP mismanagement of our NHS, and none of the candidates to replace Nicholas Sturgeon are up to the job of fixing it. Because surely the people that created the problem can't be the ones to fix the problem. First Minister. Well, firstly, just to be very clear, I, I specifically said in relation to Dr Adams, uh, not uh, specifically in relation to, to young Harvey's case, but generally the, the comments and the concerns that he has cited, I have asked for uh, further external assurance uh, to make sure uh, that uh, we have properly investigated uh, those. So nobody's hiding behind anything. Um, Anna Sarwar must be uh, one of the only people, of course Douglas Ross is in this category as well, uh, that steadfastly refuses to recognise the impact of COVID on the NHS here. Um, well, uh, Anna Sarwar was saying, I, I have already referred to Dr. I'm not talking about Dr. Adams, but week after week, week after week, Anna Sarwar stands here Thank you. and wants to pretend that COVID didn't happen. Yes, there were pressures on our NHS before that, but everybody understands uh, the significant exacerbation uh, of COVID uh, on the NHS. That's the case in Scotland, Wales, uh, England and most other countries across Europe and the world. I uh, can also say, and this is really important, I've said this many times, and I think it does a disservice to Anna Sarwar to suggest otherwise. Uh, no staff in the NHS are gagged. We've got whistleblowing arrangements in our National Health Service, and all staff who have concerns uh, should feel able to come forward um, and make sure that they raise them. And finally, presiding officer, I've uh, been in this post uh, for more than eight years, as I may have said once or twice already today. I've taken the duty and the responsibility of this office seriously, uh, as everybody would have the right to expect me to do every single uh, day, right through uh, the very difficult days of COVID and uh, every other day beside. Um, and I will continue to do that for the remaining days I am in office. And I know that whoever stands here after me will also do that. Uh, government is difficult. It's difficult in the best of times. These are not the best of times. Uh, but the people of Scotland uh, are the ultimate arbiters of who is competent, uh, who is doing the job uh, well and who is not. And they have put their trust in this government consistently since 2007, eight times in the eight years of my leadership. And the task of my successor is to make sure they retain that trust. It is precious and it is essential to achieving anything. Question number three, Tess White. To ask the First Minister whether she will provide an update on the Scottish Government's progress towards reducing the number of people on hospital waiting lists and ending long waits 
for NHS treatment? First Minister. Uh, yes, I can. The total number of patients waiting over 18 months for a new outpatient appointment was down 27% in a single quarter. The numbers waiting over two years uh, for inpatient and day cases uh, was down 60% over six months. Uh, and the numbers seen in December 2022 were at the highest level since the pandemic began. Uh, the number of patients waiting for a diagnostic test uh, was reduced uh, by more than 7% in the last quarter. Uh, this is, of course, down to the hard work of our frontline NHS staff to clear uh, long waits that have been exacerbated by the pandemic. Uh, of course, we need to go further and continue to grow capacity in our National Health Service, uh, which is why we will be, for example, opening four new national treatment centres over the coming year. Test point. Figures from NHS Grampian show two inpatients have waited more than five and a half years for treatment. In NHS Grampian, for orthopaedic surgery alone, waiting times are 18 to 24 months, with more than 3,800 people on the waiting list. I have a constituent on that list who is in debilitating pain. It's impacting her physically, emotionally and financially. No meaningful progress has been made to reduce the number of people on waiting lists, as Kate Forbes has said. And now Health Secretary Hamza Youssef is more focused on the SNP's succession plan than the NHS recovery plan. Yeah, yeah. What does the First Minister have to say to my constituent and the thousands of other people suffering in pain on these waiting lists? First Minister. What I will say uh, to the members' constituent and to anyone who is on an NHS waiting list, that this government will continue to focus on investment and recruitment and reform in our NHS to get those waiting lists and waiting times down. It is simply wrong, um, and uh, the facts do not bear it out, uh, that progress is not being made um, in reducing the longest waits. I've already set out the progress uh, over recent months in reducing the longest waits, both for outpatient appointments and for inpatient appointments uh, and for diagnostic tests. Is that progress yet good enough? No, it is not. The challenge in our NHS is significant. But we will continue with the investment, with the recruitment and with the reforms that are necessary to make sure that we deliver for all patients every day in our National Health Service. Jackie Bailey. Earlier this week, BBC Scotland revealed that one in five people had paid for private medical care in the past 12 months. And let's be clear, these are people on lengthy waiting lists and they are so desperate for treatment that they're scraping together their savings to go private. The Private Healthcare Information Network tells us that the number of private operations has increased by 72%. And in 2021 alone, 40% of all hip and knee replacements were done privately. Even the Health Secretary's targets for ending the longest waits of over two years have all been missed each and every one of them. Now, just a few months ago, NHS board chief executives were discussing a two-tier system of healthcare in Scotland with some people paying for their care. Does the First Minister now accept that in reality, under this SNP government, the two-tier system is already here? First Minister. Uh, no, I, I don't. Um, but I do consider it unacceptable that any patient uh, has to pay privately for treatment that they should be getting um, and want to get on the National Health Service. That is why we continue to focus in the ways that I have been speaking about in bringing down waiting times and we will continue uh, with that focus and I know it will be a priority for whoever uh, succeeds me as First Minister as it has been a priority for me every day in this job. Um, now Jackie, the, the targets have not been missed. The targets on reducing long waits uh, are being met and we need to go further and will uh, go further. But Jackie Bailey, and I know this will get uh, howls uh, of objection from uh, the Labour benches, but Jackie Bailey herself uh, is trying to suggest that the challenges in our National Health Service are uniquely down to the fact that Scotland has an SNP government. So let me uh, give the counter to that. Uh, she quoted the Private Health Information Network figures, so she won't mind me also quoting the Private Health Information Network figures for self-funded private care in the second quarter of 2022, the most recent figures. Uh, in Wales, where Labour are in office, Jackie Bailey wants to do the comparisons when it suits her. In Wales, where Labour are in office, self-funded private care, according to the Private Health Information Network, was 27% higher 
than it is in Scotland. And not just that, presiding officer, the rate of increase in Wales for those opting to self-pay for private health care was 21 percentage points higher in Scotland, uh, in Wales than in Scotland. So I am responsible. This government is responsible for health uh, in Scotland. But for those who want to suggest that the challenges in our National Health Service are down to, uniquely down to an SNP government, if they're Tories, they need to look at performance in England, and if they're la uh, Labour, they really need to look at performance in Wales. Question number four, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what impact the proposed pay settlement for teachers, if accepted, will have on other Scottish Government budgets. First Minister. Well, this is a very fair offer for teachers in very challenging circumstances. Indeed, it represents the best pay offer to teachers in more than 20 years. Uh, delivering it, of course, will require the Scottish Government to make very hard financial choices and therefore it will have an impact in other parts of the Scottish Government budget. Uh, that, however, is necessary and I believe it is right, given the importance of resolving uh, this dispute, which uh, the Education Secretary has worked uh, very hard to do, uh, and in the interests of ensuring that young people's education is not further uh, disrupted, and of course also in the interest of valuing teachers who do such a good job in schools right across the country. Christine Graham. I thank the, for, thank the First Minister for reply. Uh, can I declare as a former secondary teacher one of my former professions, I have high regard for it and I do hope settlement can be reached. But First Minister, what will this proposed pay settlement mean for teachers in Scotland, in particular in comparison with teachers in the rest of the UK? First Minister. Um, well, this offer, uh, which as I say is the, the best pay offer to teachers in uh, more than 20 years, uh, will see uh, the salaries of most teachers uh, rise by more than £5,000 in April uh, if the new pay offer uh, is accepted. Uh, the 28-month deal uh, has a cumulative value of 14.6% and would mean an overall increase of more than £6,100 over two years uh, for the 70% of classroom teachers at the top of their main grade scale. Uh, teachers are amongst the best paid anywhere in the world. They move more quickly to the top of the pay scale than in any other OECD uh, country. And in terms of UK comparisons, new fully registered teachers in Scotland are the best paid anywhere in the UK. So this is a good deal. It's a fair deal. I hope it's accepted and this dispute is resolved. Stephen Kerr. It's a great relief to everyone involved that this dispute finally looks like it's over. But isn't this whole episode typical of what her Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Kate Forbes, has called the mediocrity of Nicola Sturgeon's time as First Minister? Eight years of broken promises and neglect of Scottish education. Yeah. Over a year of on-off negotiations, yeah. even to get to this point, and damaging disruption. Wouldn't she agree that Scotland's teachers, parents, children and young people deserve better? Yeah. First Minister. The hypocrisy here is utterly staggering because, yes, this has been a tough negotiation, but it's because the Scottish Government has been determined to find resolution with our partners in local government that we are where we are right now. Uh, and why is uh, Stephen Kerr's uh, approach here utterly hypocritical is because he is a Conservative and when we look at the Conservative government in England we find a completely different approach. Here's what the Tory Secretary of State for Education said uh, about teacher pay negotiations. That's not what government is there to do. So... <laughs> You know, let, let me give the full quote. Uh, we don't negotiate pay. That's not what uh, they're, we are here to do. Well, in this government, we think that is part of what we're here to do. Get round the table. Agree fair pay deals for the NHS for teachers. Um, and that is one of the many reasons why the people of Scotland do continue to put their trust in this SNP Scottish government. Michael Mara. Thank you, President Officer. 
The EIS ballot on this last gasp offer ends tomorrow. We all hope that this dispute can end because lost learning responsibility rests with this government. Can the First Minister assure young people in targeted constituencies such as our own that the SQA will make special provision to ensure they get a fair chance of success? And what will the government do to ensure that all payments are in this month's pay run, the last of the financial year, to avoid tax and benefits chaos for many, many teachers? First Minister, I very much hope that we will see this pay offer accepted and that teachers uh, will get the substantial increase to their salary that I uh, believe they deserve. Uh, Education Scotland, of course, uh, will continue to take steps, as will the SQE as appropriate, uh, to ensure that pupils are properly supported. Uh, the approach of this government, whether it's in the NHS, the wider local government workforce or the, the teaching profession, uh, in very, very tough times where inflation is putting significant pressure on our budget is to get round the table, to respect trade unions and to negotiate fair pay deals. If only that was happening in other parts of the UK in the way that it is happening in Scotland, we might all be in a much better position. Question number five, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to support homeowners seeking to reduce their energy bills. First Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government has allocated £336 million to heat energy efficiency and fuel poverty measures this year. £119 million of that is targeted specifically at fuel poor households. Uh, we have also doubled the Fuel Insecurity Fund and provided an additional £1.2 million to help advice services meet increasing demand. Uh, we are and will continue to do everything we can within our limited devolved powers, but of course the key levers here uh, lie with the UK Government. So we will also continue to call upon the UK Government to protect those struggling with their energy bills. And I urge anybody who is struggling to contact Home Energy Scotland, who can provide advice and support on how to manage energy costs. Brian Whittle. Can I thank the First Minister for that reply? Uh, the current cost of living crisis has highlighted the benefits of improved energy efficiency in homes, an area where Scotland has sadly lagged behind for too long. Now, the Scottish Government's existing proposals on home retrofitting for energy efficiency are, like the pledge for a mil to, uh, to, to retrofit a million homes with heat pumps by 2030, long on ambition but short on detail. Every key question about how their goals are going to be achieved, from who pays to how they're going to have enough people with the skill to carry out the work, is still unclear. First Minister, these are Scottish Government initiatives and goals, and however laudable and necessary these targets are, they are worthless without a route to achieve them. Yeah. Does the First Minister accept that a detailed, practical programme for implementation will be vital to delivering net zero homes, and if so, when, we are when are we likely to get sight of them? First Minister. Well, of course, Brian Whittle rightly uh, references the cost of living crisis. Let's remember the cost of living crisis is largely created by an incompetent UK Tory oh, government. Yeah, yeah. We will continue to take our responsibilities uh, seriously, not just to helping people through what we all hope are short-term cost of living pressures, but to make sure that we are insulating and improving energy efficiency in our homes for the sake of the environment longer term as well. As I said earlier on, we have already allocated more than £300 million to heat energy efficiency and fuel poverty measures in this year alone. Uh, that is being delivered through a package of support via some long-standing programmes that have already supported over 150 thousand households that are in or at risk of fuel poverty and we will consider it uh, continue these short and long-term plans to make sure we're delivering for the people across Scotland. Stephanie Callahan. Households in my constituency and across Scotland expect to see their energy bills rise by over £1,000 from next month, eating up more than 13% of the average Scots take-home pay. Will the First Minister urge the UK Chancellor to use next week's spring budget to halt this increase? which will have a devastating impact on so many of our constituencies when our finances are already uh, stretched to breaking point. And will she support the call from Age UK for an amnesty on prepayment metres, which are penalising some of the poorest, poorest people in our society even further? First Minister. 
Uh, yes, I agree with all of that uh, and will certainly uh, take those steps. It is really important and there's been some uh, positive uh, noises from the UK Government uh, around this and I, I hope to see these uh, realised and turned into concrete commitments in the budget, UK budget uh, next week. But it is essential that the proposed increase to the energy price guarantee cap uh, is uh, cancelled. Uh, failure to do that would mean an estimated increase of 120,000 Scottish households in fuel poverty, taking the estimated total total uh, to almost one million. I hope we can all agree that would be completely unacceptable and it can be avoided if the UK government so chooses. Question number six, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the First Minister in light of Scottish Apprenticeship Week this week how the Scottish Government is supporting people into apprenticeships. First Minister. I was delighted to visit City Building in Glasgow earlier this week to launch Scottish Apprenticeship Week and meet with some fantastic young people there who shared their own uh, apprenticeship journeys with me. Uh, the Scottish Government is working with Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Funding Council to maximise apprenticeship opportunities and ensure that employers wishing to take on an apprentice are supported to do so. The modern apprenticeship quarter three statistics show an increase of 7.1% in those starting an apprenticeship compared to the same period last year. Uh, and despite a context of the most turbulent economic and financial uh, situation that most of us can remember, the Scottish budget for the forthcoming financial year delivers record investment in education and skills. Uh, and we have kept the Skills Development Scotland budget broadly in line with last year, allowing it to fund both modern and foundation apprenticeships. Stuart McMillan. Thank the First Minister for that answer. On Monday, I visited River Clyde Holmes' headquarters in Greenock to learn more about their apprenticeship programme and heard directly from the apprentices how working for RCH has helped with their development and offered them opportunities. River Clyde Holmes' investment in youth recruitment has also led to them being awarded platinum accreditation from investors in young people, making them only one of 11 organisations in Scotland to achieve this accolade. Well, the First Minister joined me in applauding RCH and their commitment to helping young people in my constituency into sustainable employment and hopes that their actions will inspire even more organisations to invest in apprenticeships. First Minister. I certainly applaud the work done by River Clyde Homes and the award of platinum accreditation from investors in young people really is testament to their commitment to offering opportunities to young people. I hope this inspires other organisations to invest in apprenticeships, which are a key way for employers to invest in their workforce, providing the skills the economy needs now and in future. Almost 12,000 individuals between 16 and 24 took up the opportunity of a modern apprenticeship by the end of quarter three, 2022-23. Scotland's apprenticeships support young people and all ages into sustainable and rewarding careers and give individuals uh, the opportunity to develop the skills they need to succeed in their chosen career. Graham Day. Thank you, President. Also, seven years ago, the Equality and Human Rights Commission identified that just 0.5 per cent of modern apprenticeships were going to young disabled people, despite their making up between 8 to 9 per cent of the target population at that time. First Minister, can I ask what progress has been made since then? First Minister. Well, can I uh, confirm that we remain very committed to helping address the barriers to young disabled people in taking on an apprenticeship and figures show significant progress has been made in this area since the study by the Equality and Human Rights Commission seven years ago that Graham Day has referred to. Uh, Skills Development Scotland provide enhanced funding contributions for disabled apprentices and training until age 29. Uh, the most recent statistics published by SDS on the 14th of February report that the disability Ability rate for modern apprenticeship starts uh, by the end of quarter three was 14.8%, uh, two percentage points higher uh, than quarter three of the previous year. Uh, just under 3,000 individuals had a known disability status, self-identified an impairment, health condition or uh, learning uh, difficulty, which is a 23.5% increase compared to the same point last year. So there has been good progress, but of course much more work still to be done. Pam Gossel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This week I met with winners of my West of Scotland Apprenticeship Awards. Apprentices spoke highly about the skills and opportunities gained, and employers boasted about the value added to their company. But the Scottish Training Federation says that while demand for apprenticeships is strong, the funding just isn't there. So can I ask the First Minister, will she commit to properly funding apprenticeships and back the STF's calls to increase the number of apprenticeships places to 27,000? 
First Minister. I don't recall the Tories putting forward a proposal in the budget that was passed recently for more funding for apprenticeships. But, you know, um, if we had uh, taken their advice uh, over the last few months to cut taxes for the richest people, we'd have less money to spend on apprenticeships and everything else. Uh, we are uh, investing strongly in modern apprenticeships. We've asked SDS to deliver at least 25,000 new apprenticeship starts in this financial year, and there are still some to be allocated. So apprenticeships is a really good news story. It's a good news story for uh, the young people uh, who are apprentices, people of all ages uh, who are apprentices. And it's a really good news story uh, for the economy because it's providing skills that we need for the future. And that's uh, more important than ever before since Tories uh, Brexit has denied us of many skills from elsewhere across Europe. We'll now move to constituency and general supplementaries. I call Joe Fitzpatrick. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, given the new proposals we're seeing from the Tory Government this week in relation to their approach to refugees and asylum seekers, does the First Minister share my concern about how this will impact on our ability to meet our responsibilities under the United Nations Refugee Convention and the European Convention of Human Rights? And does she share my disgust at the spectacle of the leader of the UK Labour Party trying to outdo the Prime Minister on his anti-immigration rhetoric? Yeah. On matters for which the Scottish Government have responsibility. Well, let's be clear. The UK Government's illegal migration bill sets out a clear intention to remove the right to seek refugee protection in the United Kingdom. It is utterly shameful and immoral. Uh, and I can still remember a day uh, when Labour <coughs> would have opposed it tooth and nail in principle um, and not in the mealy mouth way that it has been doing. Here's what the UN Refugee Thank Agency you. said. It would be a clear breach of the Refugee Convention and would undermine a long-standing humanitarian tradition of which the British people are rightly proud. All of us, without exception, should be appalled that the Home Secretary has introduced such a bill, uh, a bill that she knows doesn't comply with the Human Rights Act, a bill which adds to the damage already inflicted on the UK's reputation as a place of refuge, the UK's credibility with international partners and the ability to meet responsibilities under the Refugee Convention and the European Convention on Human Rights. It is a bill that this government does not support, will never support, and nobody who has any concern for our fellow human beings should ever support such an appalling piece of draft legislation. Yeah. Douglas Lumsden. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Thank you, President Officer. This weekend, the Parliament rugby teams of Scotland and Ireland will play a match in memory of our former colleague and friend, David Hill, who sadly died playing in the same fixture last year. After the game, there will be a fundraising dinner to benefit two charities, Cardiac Risk and the Young and Murrayfield Injured Players Foundation. Will the First Minister join me in wishing both teams well and also acknowledge the strength and courage of David's parents, Roger and Sharon, who have been instrumental in organising this weekend's events so some good can come from this awful tragedy? First Minister. Um, can I Presiding officer, associated myself wholeheartedly uh, with those comments. I think all of us uh, still remember uh, the sense of shock uh, last year when we heard of David's sad passing. Um, I had some communication at the time uh, with David's parents, Roger and Sharon, and my thoughts remain with them at what I am sure is an incredibly difficult time for them. Uh, the fixture uh, this weekend will be a fitting tribute to David. I wish both teams well and, uh, of course, pay tribute to the charities uh, that money is being raised uh, to support. So uh, let's all, uh, in the session of First Minister's Questions, where uh, rightly and properly in our democracy we've had some robust exchanges uh, remember somebody uh, who gave a lot to our democracy in this parliament he's sadly missed by all of us uh, across the chamber uh, particularly by uh, his colleagues and the conservative benches but he was an example uh, of what we should aspire to in public life and in politics so uh, if it is uh, the closing question today it's a good one uh, to remind us presiding officer of our common humanity uh, and remember somebody uh, that we all miss greatly I will take one further question. Paul Sweeney. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the plight of Morton's Rolls in Drumchapel, where 250 workers responsible for creating an iconic Scottish brand now face an uncertain future. In the past few days, investors have come forward and have put government ministers in touch with them, and they are due to meet this afternoon. And whilst there is undoubtedly a deal to be done here, it will require the government to do its bit to ensure that there is a sufficient level of capital investment and business support to make sure production can be restarted on a sustainable footing as soon as possible. So can I ask the First Minister today if she will commit her government and its agencies to doing everything in their power to save Mortons, save these skilled jobs in a depressed area, and ensure that this household name can prosper for decades to come. First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I will give the commitment uh, to doing everything possible to uh, try to preserve uh, Morton's roles um, and the jobs of those uh, who depend on it. Um, I, like everybody else, was deeply concerned of uh, the company's decision to cease trading last week in uh, my pre-politics life. I used to work in Drumchapel. I know how important a company like uh, this is to people uh, there and to the sense of community. And, of course, Morton's uh, is an iconic Scottish brand. So the Scottish Government, working uh, with Glasgow City Council, will do everything we possibly can uh, to see whether there is a rescue package that allows the company to continue trading and continuing to make the contribution that has made for some time uh, to the community of Drumchapel. Chapel. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. Point of order, Myrtle Fraser. I'm grateful, Presiding Officer. Um, over the last number of weeks, we've been subject to increasingly tiresome interruptions from protesters in the public gallery. Now, in a democratic society, we uh, recognise there is a right of peaceful protest, but this is very disruptive for those of us in the chamber, for other uh, people who have come to watch proceedings in the public gallery, and for those watching at home who tune in to see uh, the First Minister and the Scottish Government being held to account. Will you, therefore, through your office and through the corporate body, look at the question of allocation of tickets to the public gallery? Are these individuals obtaining tickets directly, or are they doing that through the offices of MSPs? What sanctions are being applied to those who are being disruptive? Are their names being taken, and are they being prevented from coming back uh, on another occasion? And what other steps can be taken to try and address what is a weekly irritation to all members? I thank Mr Fraser for his point of order and I can assure him and all members that work is underway with regard to the disruption that the Parliament is experiencing and has done so over this last period of weeks. I have held discussions with the Bureau, with the SPCB, with party leaders and members more widely. They are ongoing. This issue will continue to be pursued and I will give members an update in due course. Thank you. We will now move on to members' business in the name of Ros McCall. There will be a short suspension to allow members to leave the chamber and visitors to leave the gallery.